You can do it. I did it when I was in high school. You can mix these two gases, you get water. I believe it because I've seen it work. I don't know how, but I know what it means when somebody says hydrogen and oxygen make water. I know what that means. Those words make sense. In fact, I can do it. I don't know how it works, but I can do it. But when somebody says, this is God and this is man, I hear the words and I don't know what they mean. Nobody does. So whether it's true or not, I still don't know what it means. That's what's going on. Even if there's a how, I don't know what you mean when you say those words. More than this, there are some things that cannot be true for the simple reason that if they are true, then they are false. There are some things like that. I'll give you an example. Back a few hundred years ago in Europe, there was an unorthodox version of uh, the Trinity being preached. And the church was alarmed at this, they said this is not the correct teaching on the subject, so they called the council. You can look it up, find the details from uh, history. It was the Fourth Lateran Council. How the scholars, the cardinals, the leaders in the church meet to discuss what is God anyway to reply to this thing. And you know what their concluding statement was at the Fourth Lateran Council? They said, there is a reality which is God. It is unique and eternal. It neither begets nor was begotten, and there is none that can be compared to him. Does it sound familiar? That's the 112th chapter of the Quran. It's a pretty good translation of 112th surah of the Quran. There is a reality which is God, unique, eternal, it begets not, nor was it begotten, and there's none compared, can be compared to him. In fact, that's why you'll find in most Catholic Bibles, most, not all, but most Catholic Bibles, will never use that word begotten, because it's not, not correct, it's not the right translation, God does not beget. Most will tell you that. Remember, my point was, some things are false because if they are true, they are still false. And that's what the third line in that surah is about. It says, lam yalad wa lam yulad. It means, he begets not, nor was he begotten. You see, if God has a son, then he doesn't have a son. I'll show you what I mean. What do we know about sons and fathers? A son is the same kind of a being as his father. The son of a horse is a horse, and the son of a man is a man. And as C.S. Lewis said in his book, Mere Christianity, he said, Just so, the son of God is God, or he isn't really a son. Something like a son, but not really a son, unless he's the same kind of a being as his father is. If I show you a, a, a pet that I've got, I've got a cat or something, I can tell you I treat it like a son, but not the son. This is a cat, this is the man. If God really has a son, his son is just like him. Now, what do we know about God? Well, for one thing, he doesn't have any parents. Nobody gave him life. What do we know about sons? To be a son means you will receive life. Otherwise, you're not a son. Nobody gave you life, then you're nobody's son. So to be a son means you received life. To be like God means nobody gave you life. Nobody gave you anything. If God has a son, his son is just like him. He doesn't have a father. Which means he isn't God's son after all. You see what I mean? It unties itself. The reason he doesn't have a son is because he himself is not a son. What is by nature not produced cannot produce something just like itself. Because that's a produced item. So it's not like the one who produced it. He was unproduced. Let that go around in your mind for a while. I said that a few years ago at a meeting, and later it came back to me by way of a certain missionary group that had been listening to these lectures. And they called that Miller's argument, which is very flattering, I suppose, but isn't my argument. It comes out of the Koran. Uh, <laughs> They want to give it a name to make it go away. Just the same as saying, oh, that's the Aryan syllogism. It means you can put it in the box marked Arius. It makes it go away. It still needs an answer.
as I say, there are people who face these things and they're working on it. And that's the kind of thing the Muslim should encourage. It's not your business, as I said before, to go telling people, oh, look, you see, you're near the truth, but uh, leave it, here's the truth. You want to encourage the work that somebody's doing. If he's looking, tell him, keep looking. There's a book that is studied by virtually anybody who studies to be uh, a priest or minister, that's whether Catholic or Protestant. It's called Early Christian Doctrine. It's by J.N.D. Kelly. Kelly talks about two subjects. What is God and what do we mean by sin? And he says, we still haven't finished these subjects. We still don't know what we mean when we say somebody died for our sins. Now, I don't quote that to tell you, you see, Kelly's right. I'm only pointing out that there are people within the system who say, we haven't finished with this idea yet. Others, of course, will disagree with me, but there are people within the system who are still thinking, and a Muslim should encourage you that and say, yes, finish what you've started. Figure this out. Because what often happens, of course, is that when people are too quick to give an answer for something, they just raise more problems. They make more problems. It gets worse, but they think they've got the answers. A man told me quite a picture in Australia one time. He says uh, the reason that uh, man needs somebody between himself and God, he says, look, God is 100% holy. And man is contaminated by sin. So man cannot deal directly with God. He needs someone in the middle. He's a mediator. Well, that sounds like an interesting explanation, but think about it. Suppose they told you in Los Angeles, out the west coast of the United States, is the holiest man that ever lived. He just radiates holiness. And some of you might say, well, I'm going to save my money, I'm going to go there, I want to meet him, I want to shake his hand. And then I'll tell you, oh, no, wait, he couldn't stand to be in the same room with you, he's too holy. You can talk to his secretary, but he won't, no one's allowed to see him, he's too holy. Can't go near him, make him sick. Does he look like a holy man anymore, or does he look like a crazy man? You see, what I'm getting at is, it can be a nice, it can have a nice sound to it, but think about it, put it in real life. What if you knew somebody like that who said, look, you can't come close to me, I'm too holy. Talk to him, he'll tell me. Would you think that's a holy person or not? And besides that, as I say, a bigger problem is raised. The man is saying, God is 100% holy. He needs someone between God and man. How holy is this one between God and man? What, 50% or what? 99%? What is it? You ask him, how holy is the one you say is the mediator? He said, 100%. Well, you still got the same problem then. You can't get close to the mediator. He's still too holy for it. It, it. it just doesn't work. Or somebody said one time, she said, look, God is like the sun, and man is like a snowflake. And if he gets too close, he melts. Well, the funny thing is, when people tell you something like that, and you ask that same person, where is God? They'll tell you everywhere. So why aren't we melting? Pay more attention, I suppose, to you have the reported words of Jesus. It says, God is so close to you, he counts the hairs on your head. He's right up close. The Quran says he's as close as the vein in your neck. Not a problem if you're talking about closeness in some sense. Again, there are still other ways to deal with problems. Here is where, basically speaking, Christianity fell into two halves. Or one half had one idea and the other half maintains another idea. Although today, people from either half may well have the idea of the other side and they don't realize it. But at one time in the Protestant Reformation, these were sharp divisions. The Protestant Reformation began with an idea that here you had a man who used to worry that, he said, no matter what I do, I still sin. And I try hard to behave, but every day something happens, I sin. And it pains him so badly. Because what sin meant was when you do something wrong. He said, every day I do something wrong, so every day I sin.